In late December of 2013, there was a 39-page patent filed on behalf of Honda Motor Company, and so that patent specified information about a seamless gearbox. And for those of you that are familiar, or you may have heard that term, these are the type of gearboxes or transmissions that are used in the MotoGP motorcycles. And even though there's a patent filed, that's all this madness you see right here, there really hasn't been any sort of good information out there for how these transmissions work, or gearboxes I should say, but there's been articles here and there, but they don't really go into detail too, too much, and they don't really clarify the patent on here. And me being me, I've had this project on my mind for the past year or two, and then I finally decided to dig in and really figure out exactly what's going on with these transmissions, the, the nuances behind them and how they work. And this, I, I decided to print everything out and you can see all my chicken scratch handwriting. And I probably spent a good, uh, at least 10 hours reading through everything and being meticulous, taking notes. And it really helped me understand it before I eventually came up with something like this. There are some important things I want to point out. This is most certainly not to scale. I actually had, because of the limitations of 3D printing, I had to oversize this slightly, but it is kind of based on the, the, the gear ratios I chose on here is based off of a Honda Fireblade design and everything's, I'd say it's probably roughly one and a half times larger. And what we'll see a little bit later is like, for example, these shift rod mechanisms right here because of the fact they're PLA, they would flex too much, it'd be too much strain on here, so you can't really get away with making parts inside that are super thin on a PLA print versus something like an actual well, MotoGP gearbox that's going to be a bit more resilient. Although, I know they sometimes have issues to where they uh, have problems. Also, another thing to point out too, this is a work in progress. I've been working on this for the past few months, sort of tweaking things here and there. I got the main design finished, uh, and what we're looking at here is actually going to be the main counter shaft and the actual shifting mechanism inside of here, which is how this thing is pretty damn cool. I will have eventually the main shaft or input shaft on here. I'm going to have a shift drum on here, and then I'm also going to have a sprocket on the rear or something of like that. It'll be a bit more finished, but this is essentially what everybody's interested about in terms of how this works. So I'm going to do my best to explain the principles behind this. Again, this is a work in progress, but you should at least get a good idea of how this works after the video is done. So hope you enjoy and we'll get started. So why even bother with the seamless gearbox? What's the point of it? Why can't we just use a regular dog box transmission? Well, whenever you have a dog box transmission, I've made a video about how it works already, but essentially the engagement dogs on there, if this screwdriver right here, for example, is my engine driven gear right here, my input gear, and I'm driving, well, the driven gear, which connects to the output sprocket and eventually the rear wheel, there, there's essentially this pressure or force on here. And whenever you go to upshift and change to another gear, you essentially need to either roll off the throttle to take pressure and force off of that, to allow it to slide and disengage and then re-engage with basically another engagement dog like that. So at some point, the throttle needs to be cut either by you, if you don't have um, an auto ignition cut system, basically what you would do in a race situation is you'll go from full throttle very briefly, let off the throttle, do a clutchless upshift, and then immediately go back on. But there's a delay in that, so there's, there's two issues with that. Well, one, you're losing time because of that. And then two, anytime you let off the throttle and then go back on, basically if this is the drive wheel, it's sending power to the ground and all of a sudden it kind of lets off a little bit and then it re-engages. And so in a bike situation, what you're trying to do in a, in a race situation is you want the bike to be as stable as possible. So any sort of input you're giving to the bike, you don't want to upset the bike geometry. And that's especially important if you're coming out of a turn, if you're having to let off the throttle a little bit and then get back on there the rear wheel can potentially step out as it loses traction then regains it so that's not a good situation either and it's like well 
Why can't I just use like something like an ignition cut system to where you don't have to do this. You basically keep full throttle and what it does is it will cut the, I think it's a mixture of it will, I think it just cuts the spark actually. I don't think it messes with the injectors on that. I, I believe that's true, but you can double check that. But they'll cut the ignition, and what that does is it briefly kills power, and that will take, again, the pressure briefly off the engagement dog, so it allows you to up shift into the, the next gear on there. But still, even though that's better than just rolling off the throttle and then going back on like that to do the same thing, you're still, losing power briefly to the rear wheels is improved but you can potentially unsettle the bike and then ultimately and when you're in the high class racing that moto gp is not only are you worried about the suspension uh or worried about the bike actually being more stable which is really important as a rider you get more confidence and that'll improve your lap times you can shave a little bit of time off the overall lap so that's the reason why ultimately honda decided to patent something like this back in 2013 and pretty much as far as I'm aware of every MotoGP competitor manufacturer is going to be using this type of gearbox on here. So how does it work? What's going on in here and how can we without any sort of ignition system to, to cut power to this how can riders give full throttle and yet this seemingly will still transmit power to the wheels uninterrupted? And that's what's so damn clever about how this thing works on here. So once again, this is not to scale. I had to blow things up a little bit. But the concepts, I try to be as accurate as possible to the actual patent. And I'm pretty close, I think, on there. So we're going to go ahead and dissect this and figure out what's going on with this, how this works, and then we'll take it from there. So the first big thing that I noticed in the patent is how the actual shifting mechanism, there's no obvious external mechanism or any sort of forks that we're familiar with, like in a conventional dog box, transmission, or gearbox. So they fit all of that. What I'll do is I'll pop this out. The actual shift control rods and the cam rods on here, the cam rods are actually these color-coded things, and I'll, I'll talk about these in a second for how they work. So the internal shifting mechanism is held or not held, but it's located inside of the counter shaft assembly on here. And yeah, it's pretty sleek, but that's not the only reason why they decided to not use a traditional fork system to move these gears around or to engage the dogs like on a conventional transmission. So we're gonna take a look and take this apart and see what's going on. The first thing I want you to observe is again the black piece right here this is the counter shaft that gray piece this is going to be the control rod and this is going to be moved by a shift drum and ultimately that's going to allow the rider to shift between the different gears of the of the gearbox like first second third fourth fifth and sixth on here and right now i'm in second gear but this is the the first gear on the the gearbox the the driven one on the counter shaft and you can see that this is freewheeling independently from our counter shaft. And then also this piece right here, this is what's known as an engagement holder device on here, at least according to the patent. Let me make sure I actually am saying that correctly. Yes, yeah, so this is the engagement holder mechanism. And within there, you're actually gonna see there's these four lever pins. There's control levers, there's shift pins. There's a lot going on inside of that engagement holder mechanism on here. So this piece right here, sort of the bronzer looking piece right here, that represents the bearing. That's what's actually allowing, there, there's two sets of bearings per gear on this one. So that's going to allow these gears to freewheel independently from the counter shaft whenever we're not using this gear on here. So uh, I believe at least from the patent drawings, it looks like they just used like a plain type of bronze bearing. I don't know if this is going to be some sort of coated metal that they're coating with the bronze or bearing type of material. That's what I'm not 100% on, but I don't believe they actually use any rollers on this. If anybody happens to... Again, I'm simply going off of what I have in the patent. I don't think anybody has access, at least anybody I know, has had access to a MotoGP gearbox like this. So this is kind of speculation, but from what I've from what I've researched on the patent, to me, that seems like the more likely candidate. This is more like 
an engine plane bearing on here to where they're relying on the the lubricant of the oil on here to create like a little lubricating film to where there's no metal to metal contact but that's as far as I or that's as much as I can speculate I would say regarding that so I'm gonna go ahead and pop this off and we're gonna take a look inside and see what's happening so the first thing I've done is I've removed this gear from the counter shaft assembly on here and this is going to be six gear on this gearbox right here so we basically have six fifth fourth, third, second, and then first gear. And remember, this is gonna be the counter shaft. What's not shown here is the main or input shaft from the engine that ultimately, when the engine's rotating, depending on what gear the rider has selected, that's gonna transmit power from the engine through these gears to ultimately the rear drive wheel through the sprocket, which is not shown on here. Again, this is a work in progress, so. Uh, but on this one, this, uh, the six driven gear on here, when I remove it out of the way, whenever whenever it's not actually covering this, you can see there's actually some interesting things going on inside of here. And this is what's known as the engagement means holder mechanism on here. And what this is gonna be doing is actually allowing you to select or deselect between these driven gears. And this outer part right here, I'm actually gonna pop this off. These, these are press fit in place, by the way, from the manufacturer. These are gonna be the bearings right here. Here's the end bearing for this side of the transmission. And ultimately, yeah, this is gonna be the correct position. Ultimately, that's going to allow these gears to freewheel or rotate independently from the counter shaft whenever they are not selected. Just like, well, a bearing's gonna allow it to happen. And as far as these little engagement tabs, I just had to design this. This is what's also was tricky about this model is I had to design it to be 3D printer friendly on that to assemble it. So in reality, these tabs won't be here from the manufacturer. This is gonna be pressed on to the engagement holder mechanism on here. But you can see if I bring this close, if this thing will come into focus a bit better, you can see I have these little notches on here to basically set this to a certain depth on here. But what's interesting about this is these little purple things on here You'll see whenever I move, what I'm gonna do is I'm moving this control shaft to different positions. You can see whenever I do that, if I can get this to move on here, you can see that's actually gonna have an effect on how these mechanisms come out on here. And that's what's actually going to select this gear. So to make it more consistent, I'm gonna go ahead and pop this bearing back on. And then we will take a little closer look at what's happening on here. So again, six gear, driven gear, removed from the equation. Here we're looking at the engagement means holder and don't worry about what that is just yet, but just what I want you to pay attention to is look at these little levers right here. They're the things in purple. Whenever I move the, right now I'm actually in fifth gear. You can see how this gear, whenever I try and rotate it, it's attempting to rotate the entire shaft, which in fifth gear you kind of want that to happen, right? So. Engine's causing this to rotate actually in this direction. And then whenever we want to upshift into sixth gear, the rider is going to press on the shift pedal on their bike, whether it's GP or, what's the other shift? Just, uh, oh wow, I forgot the name of it. <laughs> well, it's GP shift or just standard shift. There we go, Jesus. Um, but anyway, you go on upshift and I want you to look at what happens with those little control rod levers. So. You see sixth gear, fifth gear. Sixth gear, that's, again, this is the position where this gear would normally go. So when you upshift into six, can you all see that movement on here? So sixth gear, see how those levers fling out? And I'm gonna flip this 180. There's actually four of these levers on here and they are both moving, or all four of them are moving out whenever you shift into a particular gear. In this case, for sixth gear, the levers fling out, and that's a big part of how it's actually going to engage and connect power from the engine through these levers to this actual engagement holder. And if you look closely on here, let me get my little pointer, you see sort of like these little tabs and notches all the way around. Again, this is normally these, let me take off the bearing on this one, so our engagement means holder, this component right here is going to be press fit onto the counter shaft on here. They don't really have these guide pins or anything like that in place. This is just so I can, again, for 3D printing and assembly and all that. But just know that the counter shaft and that annular plate member are essentially 
press fit to where you can consider them one component on there. Whenever they're press fit together, they ain't going anywhere. They're not moving. So if you want to transmit power from the engine to the driven gear, remember these are supported by bearings on here. So for example, let me put this down. Right now on their own, if I hold this, you can see how it freewheels. It's not directly connected to the counter shaft on here. But if we want to connect them to the counter shaft, that's the point of these levers. They're going to fling out. And how does flinging out have anything to do with how it engages it? Well, let me show you. What I have here is an earlier version of this model. This is the engagement means holder. The things in purple, those are going to be your levers to actually connect our driven gear to the counter shaft right here, which ultimately remember there's gonna be a sprocket which goes to the rear wheel on these bikes. So how do we connect this to the counter shaft on here? And that is what the engagement means holder is going to do. It's the interface between the actual shift control rods on here, or the cam rods I should say. Whenever you're actually moving the shift mechanism, these things are moving back and forth inside there. We'll take a look at these a little bit later on. But what I want you to pay attention to is sort of the setup on here. So I'm going to move these out the way. This is one half of the engagement means holder on here. You see these channels? There's four of them. What you're going to have riding up and down on those channels are going to be these shift pins right here. Now what happens is whenever you actually are upshifting or downshifting, these cam rods are going to be sliding inside of the counter shaft and you can see in specific points on here there are going to be grooves on here and those grooves are going to interact with the shift pins and based on the shift pin movement whether it goes drops down into the groove or moves up is going to change the position of these little control rods uh, the levers so for example we're just going to take a look at one out of the four for now so this particular lever is going to interact with this shift pin right here. And you can see, well actually can't see it right now. You see this groove right here, this little rectangular notch? Let me make sure I position this to where you can see it okay. So this notch right here, normally there is a spring that sits here. Now this isn't exactly like the patent. Let me get a closer shot of this you can kind of see this what i ended up doing there you go so in the patent this spring for the lever mechanism is rectangular and i tried to be as accurate to the patent as possible but i found i was gonna i originally was gonna wind my own spring but it was gonna be too inconsistent and this has to be like is this <laughs> this gearbox is very finicky so everything has to be extremely consistent the tolerances on here, we're talking about 0.1 millimeter between this working properly and not. So there's a lot of time filing and sanding and making sure everything works. So the springs, I ended up having to go with the circular one. And I just did this insert just to kind of hold it in place. But in case I ever do find a rectangular spring, I may swap them out. But this works just fine. So normally, this spring will go in here like that. Here we have our lever mechanism. Let me very carefully position it. You can see that we have this effect on here. This wants to, well, whenever the spring's in compression, it wants to throw the lever out. But that is all determined by the position of this shift pin. So right now when the pin is roughly, let me get this held in place right about here. It's kind of tricky. Whenever the pin's in that position, <laughs> my finger's blocking everything, geez. Sorry. All right, let's try, let's try that again. So again, spring is here that's in compression, it's wanting to push that lever out, right? So you can see I release it, it wants to move out. Well, if the pin, now let me move my thumb out the way, if the pin is being pushed up by this little cam rod right here, that's gonna cause it to move in. And whenever that happens, this gear is disengaged from the counter shaft, right? So that's when the pin is pressed up against here. It's compressing the spring. This thing is not gonna interact with that driven gear. However, if these little notches on here happens to line up with that shift pin, that shift pin is going to drop down. And the result of that is you can see how the lever, the tail end of that, moves in, whereas this part actually moves out. And this part right here, this lever, 
the end of that is actually what's going to engage these almost kind of look like engagement dogs but this is what they call like an abutment end it's just a protrusion on the gear so that lever is going to protrude out interact with those and then transmit that motion from the engine through that to the lever to the actual counter shaft and that's what's actually transmitting power on there so let me show you okay so the thing in bronze is our engagement holder means mechanism it's literally going to hold all the components together once again the things in purple that's the lever we have our pivot pins in black and then our shift pins are going to be in gray the thing in red is one of the cam rods and that is going to move back and forth within our counter shaft back here there's a total of eight of them let me verify yep there's eight of them and ultimately in this position right here basically we have the flat section of the cam rod right here I'm kind of holding it I'm, I'm making sure y'all can see it okay the flat part of that is going to be traveling and you can see that in this position that's not going to cause the pin to move up or down it's just going to be sort of stationary here and the result of that is for example if the gear is spinning in this direction I had to take the springs out too but just know that right now the springs in those pockets are in compression the rods pressing up on those shift pins and you can see whenever I do that that's causing them to basically these ends here and here are moving in, or actually let me use my fingers on here. So this end right here, that's moving in, and this end right here is moving in and away from these projection points on the speed gear. So the result of that is nothing happens. This is going to freewheel. I'm gonna be very careful not to touch anything. Probably still bumped some things. But yeah, you can see the result is the speed gear is not going to interact with those levers and all is fine in the world. But again, the moment the rider wants to up or downshift, in this case, I'll just say upshift for this example. What's going to happen is this control or the cam rod is going to move to this point. You see that how there's a notch and remember there's a spring under compression. So the whole time it's trying to push up on this lever. So the moment that that shift pin aligns with that notch, that spring is going to force that pin down. And you can see the result of that is now our lever right here projects outwards. And at the same time, this one is also gonna do the same thing. That's why there's a total of eight of these rods and you'll find out in a second why that is. But this one is also going to drop down. And there's also two more sets of these on here. There's gonna be a shift pin right here, shift pin right here. Uh, lever right here, lever right there, as well as a pivot point for those levers as well. So a total of four levers move out. These two lever sets apart from one another, that one's going to be for acceleration. And then the other one, the other ones are going to be for deceleration. So let me show you what this is doing right now. So let's just say we're accelerating and the gear is moving in this position. You can see that now because of the fact that the lever ends right here and here are projecting out. Now when I rotate it, you can see that it's going to catch that. And now look at that. The whole thing begins rotating. And remember, our engagement means holder, that's going to be press fit to the counter shaft on here. And they, they may actually have indexing tabs on here. I'm not sure, but based on the patent, I didn't see anything. So we're just going to assume they're press fit. So that is considered to be permanently joined to the counter shaft on here during assembly. And the result of that is, look, now we have power transfer from the engine gear. I mean, it's not shown, but let's just say this gear right here is the engine. That's spinning, and that's going to transmit power or torque through the gear, through this lever, through the engagement means holder. <laughs> you hear my cat in the background. And ultimately to the counter shaft, to the sprocket, driving the rear wheels on here. So that's during acceleration, for example. But what if you want to maybe drive this the other way during deceleration on here? Well, that just means the gear is going to go in the opposite direction. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this pin over here. And you can see it's actually flipped like so. So again, we're going to say this one's for acceleration, this one's for deceleration, and whenever the gear actually moves back, just know there's another lever set over here facing the same direction. You'll still have a pin that's dropped down 
into a little channel on another type of camera rod like this. And the result is when you go backwards, it's still the same thing. You actually have, so actually in this setup, I, I said that incorrectly, um, you would actually have the wheel drive the gear. So for example, it's not the, 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 it's not the gear that's turning. It would be the actual engagement holder device that turns, but it's still the same effect. You can see that now that's going to drive this and basically you're going to have engine braking on top of that. I'm not going to go into that because it's already going to be a pretty long video from what I can gather on this one. But that's why they have a lever flipped basically 180 degrees on here and just know there's going to be four of them, four shift pins, and that's how they're going to engage with these little projections right here. So pretty cool. Um, but what happens, for example, if you had, for instance, and again, I'm going to go back to my original setup. We're going to say that we're going back to original acceleration, upshifting, all that fun stuff. So let's just say we're in a situation to where you decide to upshift and those of you who are watching and who have or active, you don't even have to be in the racing scene or track day scene. Let's just say you got a little lazy on your upshifts and you kind of uh, didn't do it well and the transmission lets you know. So the reason why I'm pointing that out is, well, let's just say we're in a situation to where you go to upshift and these aren't exactly aligned with these projections. Like, let's just say they're just starting to come up. So let's just say again, this, keep in mind, this is rotating very, very fast. So let's just say we upshift. We know the pins are going to drop down. These start moving out. Again, that's going to, I moved it the wrong way. That's going to drop down. That starts moving out. But let's just say we're not quite, I don't know if you can capture it on a camera, but see how we're barely making contact on here. And so you don't want to destroy this. So we need some sort of mechanism on here to allow this to engage properly. And I purposely disassembled this piece right here from this because this is already, there, there. there's a lot going on inside of here. So I don't know if you can tell on the camera, but you see these little notches here and here? There's actually four of them. And on two of them, I have these spring mechanisms. And I don't know if you can tell, but this piece right here, this is what's known as the annular plate member. And what is installed in place, I don't know if that's showing up on camera. Yeah, you can see it pretty well. See how it lines up basically with the projected portions of the speed gear. So again, in yellow, that's the annular plate member. This is the driven gear. So that is actually going to be used for that purpose or to prevent against uh, damaging the lever and making sure you have full engagement of this. Now, you're supposed to have, again, this is as accurate as, as I can make it, the type of spring that I used in here. Let me actually zoom in a bit so you can see if it'll focus on there. So you can see there's a spring in that little pocket right there. And let me try to keep that in frame. Please stay focused. See that little notch cut out in this annular plate member right here that I'm kind of wiggling around? So there's supposed to be four of those springs in here, but I found like the, the type of spring I found is very difficult to locate this type of spring I got off of McMaster. And uh, the spring tension's just, uh, or the rating's a bit too stiff, so I ended up having to just use, you can see I have another one on the opposite side. Two is more than enough, but just know there's supposed to be four of those springs. But anyway, what's cool about these, I'll go ahead and drop this back in, and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to install my little snap ring. It's how it is in the patent as well. They're just gonna use a little snap ring or circlip just to kind of keep everything in place. So, what I want you all to notice is when I move the annular plate member, see how it springs back on here? That's actually key for how this thing works. So now we're going to put this into the equation to figure out what's going on here. So let's just say again, we're in that situation to where we decide to upshift and this is going to be, ooh, this is going to be really difficult to show on camera. Let me actually flip this around and see if this will work better. Yeah, you can actually see it better this way. So I'll, I'll show you. This, is, this isn't the right orientation, but this will still kind of hopefully get across what I'm trying to show you. So let's just say we're in that situation. In fact, I'm going to take this one out of the equation and we'll just, just know that it's happening all the way around. So I'm also going to 
take our shift pin out of the way as well. So let's just say we're in a situation, we're up shifting, and we're like at about this point to where this lever is starting to swing out, but it's not quite in aligning with our little projection right here. So what happens is, as this lever comes up, it hits the angled portion of that ring. And what that does, I'm actually get the shift pin out of the way too. I'm going to try to actually, you know what, I'm gonna hold this up so you can see. Hey, right, let's try again. So again, let's just say we're in this situation right about here and this lever starts to swing out like this, but we're not quite contacting it just yet. This is going to hit that annular plate member in such a way that whenever it's rotating around, you have the little spring mechanism and the, the angles that they choose on here, that's gonna cause this thing basically, it's going to press it down and cause it to slide. Do you see that little spring action on here? So I'm gonna try to show that once. I know it's not the easiest thing to project on here, but it's going to hit that in such a way that spring is gonna provide sort of a cushioning effect and then also cause that lever to basically travel underneath it. It's gonna delay the action. And keep in mind that the whole time no, I'm kind of fumbling here, trying to hold everything. But keep in mind the whole time there's a spring pushing up on this. So what that does is it causes it to sort of bypass it momentarily. Then as it makes its way around, that spring is now gonna push it up and contact this end. So by the time it comes around, you can see that now, if I flip this around from this side, you can see that now it's had plenty of time to basically ride up on the edge and then come into full contact on here. And you can see that annular plate member, that's why they have the spring mechanism in there too. As it comes around, that spring is gonna kinda move the plate member out the way to where the lever can actually engage that gear right there. So this is mainly acting as like a safety mechanism to where if this flips up and it's not quite to the point where it's gonna engage it, it's gonna follow that little guide ramp on the annular plate, kinda come up to this position, travel all the way around like that, and keep in mind, this is happening with all the, well, at least uh, a pair of the levers on here. So that'll come away. Again, that's going to divert it, come around, follow that gear, hit the annular plate member at the, they have specific angles on here to where it's going to catch that, push the annular plate member out of the way, and that's going to engage these little projections on here. So I hope that kind of makes sense. Uh, this was not the easiest thing to show. This part is kind of finicky, unless it's together. But essentially they're doing that to help ensure the engagement is true and that there's not any sort of slipping or anything going on. So, uh, one more thing to clarify too. I think I've already mentioned this, but I'll just, uh, just know that they're going to use two levers opposing one another for acceleration, and then the two levers over on this side will be used for deceleration on there. And so you're always gonna have a set of levers kind of going like opposing one another, or not opposing one another, but kind of like uh, like 180 degrees from one another. So you have a set like this, and then you'll have another set basically like this. One for engaging it in this direction, one for engaging it, or a pair for engaging it in this direction, and then another pair for engaging it in the opposite direction. And hopefully that kind of makes sense. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to take this apart a bit more and then kind of explain, again, apart from the shifting mechanism, it being different, but then we have to also explain why they're, or what's actually causing or allowing the gearbox to transmit power to the rear drive wheel without any sort of loss in uh, loss in torque. So seamless transmission. So we're gonna take a look at that next. Let's see how well this shows up on camera. So if you look really, really close on here, it kind of lighting's kind of, oh, there we go. That's a little bit better. So you see the yellow and purple? That's gonna be the cam rods, which ultimately are going to cause these shift pins in the actual engagement holder mechanism right here to move up or down depending on this position. So right now, you can see how those levers are flared out. Right now, fifth gear is engaged, and all that needs to happen to go from fifth to sixth gear is that control rod moves up a certain distance, and 
I don't know how well you'll pick up on that, but see how those little notches came into view? That causes this pin to drop down. So I'm going to try to <laughs> balance this while I shift back into fifth gear. I'm going to try to keep this shift pin like that. And ooh, I don't know how well this is going to show up on camera. This may not work. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to abandon it. But again, right now we are in if this thing would focus Right now, we are in fifth gear, and then shifting into sixth, and you see how those notches come into place? So the same thing is gonna happen if I go from sixth back to fifth. You can see those levers springing out, and that's happening again all the way around. So I'll put the engagement means holder back in place for here, so you can kind of see this and this interacting. What I've done is I've removed fifth, and six gear, so we can take a look at the engagement means holder activation of these gears. So let me actually go into fourth gear on here. You can see how that gear, if I try to rotate it independently from the counter shaft, that's not possible, it's just gonna spin the whole thing. So if I shift from fourth to fifth gear, I want you to look at what happens. So fourth to fifth gear, see how those levers fling out and just know that they are engaging with those little protrusions on here and that's what's going to lock this to the counter shaft on here. And then when I go from fifth to sixth gear on here, you can see it swaps to those levers. So now we're back into, let me try to keep this in an angle so you can see them both operating. So basically we are in fifth gear right now. And if we want to go to sixth, those are going to retract and <laughs> got a little stuck on there. So those are going to retract six gear levers going to fling out. And then if you go from sixth back to fifth, these retract, the other ones expand out. And once again, six gear, fifth gear, six gear, fifth gear, but still haven't explained yet. Again, this is a cool shifting mechanism. They're keeping everything internal, but I still haven't explained how we're able to get torqued delivered uninterrupted through the gears without having a sort of delay and again we're talking about tenths of a second potentially milliseconds but that's still enough to unsettle the suspension potentially lose out on time so how are they getting around that well it's actually key to how this works on here and if you were paying attention if you look the engagement uh, the levers on here are actually not oriented the same way they're actually offset a little bit and that's where we're now going to look at our actual control rod mechanism with these little cam rods as well to see what's going on on here. It's pretty clever. So remember those notches we talked about? Here we can clearly see them on all these different colored. Those are basically all the cam rods on here and those are all going to pass internally in the counter shaft. If I hold this up to here, granted you can't really see it too well, but you see all those notches on here? And my cat in the background. So, all those notches are gonna be where the cam rods are going to be sliding back and forth on here. And you can see there's a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight little notches. They're gonna be machined little ways for our cam rods. This is an older one I have. I updated the design, many, I have many iterations on here. These are gonna be sliding back and forth and ultimately, the notches on here, and I'll flip it around, that's what's going to be interacting with those shift pins that I was showing you earlier. And just for reference, go ahead and grab one of the extra older ones I have real quick. Just for reference, these little guys right here, the shift pins ultimately are going to be, again, the, the cam rods themselves, that's what's gonna be moving. But the shift pin basically is gonna be going along this rail until it drops into a notch, and that's what causes those little levers to basically protrude out. And these are gonna be your actual gear positions. So you can see the red and green rods are gonna be basically for your odd number gears. Here's the first gear notches for that. It's gonna be the same thing on the other side, because remember, you have opposing levers. You'll have a lever on this side and a lever on that side. And then um, also, this is going to be for third gear as well. Uh, two levers will swing out over on this side, two levers swing out over on that side. And just to show you what I'm talking about, here's what I mean. You can see a red and green over there for third gear, and red and green over there for third gear. And then 
for fifth gear, it's going to be further back in here. By the way, this is not normal. I've pulled this out so you can kind of see the mechanism in here. This thing is, whenever sixth gear is engaged, the front of this control rod right here is only going to be protruding out about eh, yay much. And keep in mind, this is all going to be con uh, contained inside of the actual housing of the transmission. So it's going to be, this is never going to see the outside of it. That way there's no dirt and debris that gets involved with this. And the actual shift drum mechanism is going to be off to the side of it. Again, I don't have that ready yet, but it, it will happen. It'll be a couple months from now. But, but anyway, this is what's, this whole assembly right here is key to how this transmission or gearbox can transmit torque without any loss or interruption in power. And that's ultimately the goal of why Honda, well, wanted to do this. This is what's known as the lost motion assembly on here. And the lost motion, the lost motion assembly consists of this control rod in the middle. We have these little cam rods right here. And then we basically, inside of there, we're going to have these cam slides, the thing sort of like in a subtle or like a machine sort of green color. That's not really a color. Sort of like this, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a satin green, there we go. Underneath that, we have these little cam slide mechanisms. And if I hold this up, you can see, granted there's gonna be, a, there's basically gonna be two sets of these little slides on here. There's one on here with the spring mechanism, and then there's another one of those internally. But the thing that I want you all to pay attention to is, look at the, the little teeth or projections on one of those little cam rods. So see the one in green right there? See how this kind of comes down and that's engaging with this cam slide in the back and not the front? Here, let me show you what I mean. And, uh, and I'll point out the, the different colors too you can see on here. The projections that I'm talking about are going to be these things. See how this kind of comes down here and here? That's going to interact with the lost motion assembly, the little, essentially the slides on there. So, let me move this out the way, bring this close so you can see what I am talking about on here. So for example, you see that purple slide? See how it's engaging with the front part right there, but not the rear? Then I flip it and you can see the yellow, it alternates. That one's going to be engaging with the back slide, that sort of satin green in the background that's kind of covered by all of them but it's not going to be engaged with the front one. Then I rotate again. That green slide happens to be engaging with the rear, but not the front. Then we rotate again. The red engages with the front. Purple engages with the front. So you can see that every two pair of cam rods, and again, these are the cam rods, the colored things. Well, I mean, everything's colored, but like the, the, uh, <laughs> the red and purple, those are engaging this front slide right here. The yellow and the green are engaging the rear slide, and then we're back to the red and purple engaging that. And these are all, these basically are going to be paired with the actual levers on here. And my cat's going wild. What are you doing? Oh. Here's my little punk child. He's wanting me to play with him, so got to give him attention. Let's get a close up view of this. So. On here, we have first gear engaged, we're simulating, so that's gonna be, and right now we're under acceleration. So we're just gonna pay attention to this cam rod, the red one basically, and right now because we're in first gear, the shift pins have dropped into that notch. Remember, that's gonna cause those levers to swing out, and those are gonna be engaging with the little projected ends right here on the actual driven gear on the counter shaft. So right now, that's putting tension, basically, or creating tension on these rods right here, whenever that's happening. So whenever you go ahead and decide to shift into second gear, because there's tension on there, the shifter's still gonna move, but look at what happens on here. See how these other pair of shift rods, and it's gonna be the same thing on the other side as well. Those are going to move independently, and that's because of how this lost motion assembly works on here. And these cam slides inside of here, there's going to be springs and sort of like these cotter pins and I'll probably have to shoot another video to show you more details of what's going on with this. But essentially all I need to know right now is that 
these sets of cam rods right here, the colored ones, can move independently from one another whenever the control rod operates. And that's dependent on what gear you're in. So right now there's tension on this first driven gear. And when you upshift in a second gear, that's going to cause, if you pay attention to this yellow rod, that's actually going to be where the shift pin, the shift pin for third gear is located, or sorry, not for third gear, for second gear is located right about here, right? So when you decide to upshift into second gear from first, that shift pin is going to drop into that notch. That lever is going to fling out and engage with the little projected parts for the second driven gear on here. Now, whenever you are in second gear, this gear will naturally spin faster compared to first just because of the way the gear ratio works on here. Because of that, right now, we're transmitting torque from the engine to first gear. Even during the upshift into second, there's still tension being uh, pushed on these through the lever mechanism, through this, to the countershaft. Still has tension on there, still transmitting torque. But the moment that second gear starts to take over, it's going to be speeding, it's going to be naturally spinning faster than first gear. So what happens is, then torque will seamlessly transmit from first to second gear. And because of the fact this is spinning faster than first, what happens is tension is actually, I didn't mean to release it, but you kind of saw what happened there. I'll back this up just a little bit, hopefully. Okay. So whenever we shift from first to second, second gear begins taking over, spinning faster. That's going to take tension off of the R lever or off of the levers that are in contact with these projected parts of first gear. And the result is you can see how those release tension from there. And that's going to fully disengage first gear from second gear. And it's the exact same thing for if you're decelerating, uh, the, you're basically what's going to be happening is you're f uh, flipping back and forth between the different control levers on here. So once again, first gear, there's tension on this. The lever is basically transmitting torque from first gear to the driven shaft. Whenever you shift into second, that control arm is going to move. Cam rod's gonna move, shift pin drops into place, levers fling outwards, start transmitting torque here because it's spinning faster. That's gonna take tension off of the first gear mechanism and release it like that. So hope that kind of makes sense. And we'll show you everything working together. Right now, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to hold the counter shaft stationary. You can see second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth gear rotate freely, but you can hear that if I am basically driving this, and by the way, from the perspective of the rider, if this is the front of the bike up here, basically our counter shaft is going to be like this, and the rear sprocket is going to connect to the back side like this. So essentially, this is going to be, the, the engine is going to be rotating, well, depending on how you look at the bike, but for me, we'll just say, um, I think the front of the engine is from the right side. Again, I, I could be wrong on this. I'm just doing this from memory. But I do know uh, that the engine is going to be rotating in this direction. Again, from the front of the bike like this, from this perspective. And that rotation is basically going to cause, you can see it's spinning the entire counter shaft. Because right now, we are in first gear. Then what's going to happen is the shift drum is going to move. That's going to pull on this control rod. And then you can see that first gear releases. Well... What we already know is that first gear basically is going to initially be bound up. Second gear is going to, oh, let me go back a little bit. Second gear is going to engage, and because of the fact it's spinning faster, it takes pressure off first gear, which causes it to release. And then again, there's that no break in power. It's going to transmit power still to the rear sprocket right here. And again, all these other gears can freewheel. First gear is freewheeling, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth is freewheeling, but second gear is now transmitting power. And then same thing when the rider wants to go ahead and, oh, let me make sure I'm in frame. When the rider wants to go ahead and upshift, again, they're not gonna take, they're not gonna roll off the throttle, they're gonna keep it pinned, full throttle, there's still pressure or force being applied to second gear. And then I'm gonna try to do this at once. We're gonna pop this control rod out. I tried, but I well, failed. Now technically second gear is momentarily engaged, but the moment that third gear takes over and starts applying torque to the shaft, that's gonna take pressure off second gear, and that's basically going to disengage, and still, for a second, uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth are disengaged, now third gear's engaged, then same thing, full throttle, go ahead and upshift into fourth gear, same thing, pressure's taken off of that, 
Now it continues. You can see I'm spinning fourth gear that's transmitting torque. These are freewheeling, these are freewheeling, all these are freewheeling. Now we start to kind of see the cam rods are exposed on here. And then again, you get to a certain RPM, certain speed, you side upshift, same thing. Clicks into fifth. That engages with this, takes pressure off here. Torque is still being applied to the rear wheel. Driving it, driving it, freewheeling. These don't matter right now. And then finally, when you get up into sixth gear, you're on the on a long straight at a circuit somewhere. And well, it's binding up a little bit. See, so yeah, I said it's a work in progress. There we go. So again, sixth gear engages. It's going to take pressure off of fifth and all these other gear, gears are still freewheeling and now when the engine is only going to transmit torque through that sixth gear and then cause this to rotate it's going to be spinning up the rear wheel you're going to be hauling ass through here and the same effect is going to happen when you downshift on here it's going to work the exact same but now it's backwards so you can see six gears released now fifth gear is engaged and i go back to there fifth gears released now you can hear fourth gear is engaged on here and we go here Downshift into third, downshift into second, and finally back into first gear. You can see how it's rotating, and all these other ones are freewheeling. So, pretty slick design on here, and I know they're not the most reliable, but keep in mind we're in a world class type of racing organization. They're trying to make it reliable enough to last a race, and essentially, I believe they have to rebuild these transmissions every time. So, yeah, pretty damn nifty though. So I hope you all enjoyed the video. Stuff like this really fascinates me and I really wanted to dive deep into what's going on inside the MotoGP gearbox on that. And since I can't really ever get access to it, I would love to have access to those gearboxes to tear it down and really see the inner workings to confirm uh, what I've done here. But I mean, this is the next best thing. So this has been incredibly challenging to get to this point so far and it works reasonably well. There's still some fine tuning and tweaking. I may have to reprint quite a few of these components, but yeah, I hope this uh, hope this helps kind of clear up some confusion about these gearboxes and hope you enjoyed the video. The next update will probably be a few months from now, honestly, this has been a lot of work, but I'm, I'm pretty happy with how this has come out so far. So yeah, hope you enjoyed it and uh, see ya.